Hey everybody, we're excited to present to you our presentation about our study abroad experience here in Taiwan. Today we're going to touch on four of our favorite parts about the culture and history here. First we're going to talk about the National Palace Museum. Next we're going to talk about night markets. Following our time talking about night markets, we're going to talk a little bit about a cool place that we went to down near Kaohsiung called Guangshan. And last but not least, we're going to follow it off with Taipei 101, Taipei 101, the most famous building here in Taiwan. National Palace Museum is so, so interesting. And it's a shame that I only have a few minutes to talk about it. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about the history. There are 608,985 relics. Actually, this number is a little bit inaccurate. These come from um, the time when the relics were moved from mainland China to Taiwan. Um, most of the artifacts come from Song, Yuan, Ming, and Qing courts. That doesn't mean necessarily the dynasties of, those, uh, of these dynasties, but the courts, the artifacts were in these courts' possessions. Um, the reason why it moved to Taiwan is in the fall of 1948, the Communist Party started to gain control of the government in China. And the Nationalist Party, who had control of the Forbidden Palace, as well as the NPM artifacts, made an executive decision to move these artifacts to Taiwan. Um, this was an incredible decision because later, in, during the Cultural Revolution, a lot of traditional artifacts and cultural heritage were destroyed in China, um, making the National Palace Museum in Taiwan the... Um, having some of the oldest and most rich history, uh, Chinese history in it. It wasn't always in Taipei, though. It used to be in Taichung, but it moved to Taipei so that it could have more foreign influence and invite more foreign people to come and um, invite them to come and understand more about Chinese uh, history and culture. Like I said, these come from the Song Yuan Ming and Qing dynasties, but some of them come as old as 4,300 BC, which is just a mind-blowing ancient. Uh, most of those were uh, bronze things that we'll see later. Different artifacts by category. Here are paintings, Buddhist statues, calligraphy, rare books, documents, ceramics, bronze, jades, and curios. Uh, there's actually much more, including furnitures and stone, stone works and ivory um, works as well. The paintings, because paintings are hard to preserve, the oldest we have are from the Tang Dynasty. The current exhibit in the National Palace Museum is this moving gardens where it depicts a lot of M royal um, court gardens and some of these beautiful flowers. Um, it was something that was really fun to learn about is they had this uh, cultural festival where um, they'd invite all the poets to come and write down their poems and as the, if they couldn't think of a poem by the time a cup of jiu, a cup of alcohol floated down to them on a river, then they'd have to drink the alcohol. It was pretty funny, um, but this was also included in part of the paintings. Um, very, very beautiful. Buddhist statues play in a huge important role in the religious part of um, Chinese culture. Uh, something interesting about Chinese culture is instead of... Um, Conversely, from traditional Indian um, Buddhism, instead of just immortalizing scholars or saints in statues, Chinese uh, Buddhism also immortalizes emperors or other historical figures, even ancestors in statues, and worships them in a similar way that Buddhist or traditional Buddhists would. Um, this is one of my favorite parts. These rare books and documents. It seems like the National Palace Museum has rare books and documents from a lot of Chinese culture. What is here is some of the Taoist scripture, the original Taoist scripture, which is super interesting as it lists the um, religious practice of the religion Taoism. What was also included is a description of the first um, Duanujia, the first dragon boat festivals. That's why there's this picture of this dragon boat and explains the different practices and traditions that people should have during the Dragon Boat Festival. Super interesting. Ceramics are a huge aspect of Chinese art and culture, probably the most influential um, piece of technology other than gunpowder that um, China gave to the rest of the world. Bronze, this is some of the oldest things, some dating, like I said, from 4,300 BCE, which is just an incomprehensible old ancient amount of time. Um, but as you can see, they use bronze for lots of different things from traditional purposes in the top left, from alcohol containers in the top in the bottom left, sacrificial uses in the, um, in the right, and weaponry as well. 
Jade, this is obviously some of people's favorite. Um, these intricate carvings in the stone is absolutely beautiful. And the top left is one of the more famous things. This actually isn't jade. This is a stone of jasper, but it falls into this jade category um, that looks like a piece of meat. Um, the more famous one, the jade cabbage, I wasn't on display when I went, so I wasn't able to take a picture of it. Another interesting thing is these like circle bracelet things are actually the more first original depictions of dragons that we have on the earth. Um, this is the oldest, um, maybe of what people thought dragons were would be. Pretty interesting. Curios. Curios is a huge miscellaneous category of lots of different things, but emperors like to have um, different trinkets or curios of rare rarity in their courts. So as you can see, they're absolutely beautiful. This top, this bright sphere is actually has 18 layers on the inside that are all movable parts so they can spin on the inside the way that they did this, this is carved out of a single ivory horn um, the way they did this was they drilled holes into it and used a curving tool carving tool to carve out each individual layer it's obviously incredible these long things are actually nail covers um, nails were that was a shona status for people who did women who didn't need to use their hands a lot would have really, really long nails. And this bottom baby is actually a pillow. So it's pretty interesting. Um, I learned so much going to this museum and I was really glad I was able to, and I'm really excited to learn more and improve my um, art critique or art knowledge rather. It was very, very interesting. Hey everybody, now we're going to head on to our next part of our presentation where we're going to be talking about one of the most famous parts in Taiwan and one of the most well-known things in Taiwan, Taiwan's night markets, Taiwan the Ye Shi. Night markets are really, really fun because these night markets are this big hub for food, culture, entertainment, shopping in Taiwan at a really fun place that brings together the community all together. These markets are really, really bustling late at night, as the name suggests. And it's a place where you can get street food, you can go shopping for clothing, you can see various different forms of entertainment. And it's really fun because all these night markets really reflect the culture of the area around it. All the night markets that you get the chance to go to are unique to the different areas. Um, they sell different foods, they have different clothing stores, and it's really kind of special. It helps reflect the people. Um, that live in the area and what makes them special. So to understand night markets, I think it's important to really understand where these night markets come from and kind of where this cultural part of Taiwan originated from. Um, this picture here on the right is actually a picture at one of the famous temples in Taiwan that's right next to the Raohe night market. It's right at the very entrance of the night market. And this is significant because many night markets in Taiwan, they originally originated near these Buddhist temples. People would come to these Buddhist temples to pray for these religious fest festivals and these ceremonies and they'd leave these temples and they'd be hungry. They wanted somewhere to eat. So people would start setting up these stalls outside these temples to help feed these people that were coming out of the temples to have them get some food and to be entertained after they came to the temple. These stalls kind of slowly grew more and more and more into the night market scene that we see today. These long spanning stretches of lots of different stalls selling lots of different food. Nowadays, it's a little bit less connected to the religious aspect of Taiwan. Taiwan's night markets have kind of become their own cultural phenomenon, but it's really cool because we can see these night markets as this intersection of religion and culture and food, all these parts of what makes Taiwan, Taiwan coming together. Um, Taiwan has a lot of different famous night markets all throughout the country. Um, they have ones in Taipei, in Taichung, and Kaohsiung. They have smaller ones all throughout the other parts, but I'm going to touch on a couple of my favorite ones that I had the chance to visit. In Taipei, there's two really well-known famous ones. The first one is Raohe, and the second one is Shilin. These are both really well-known because they have a lot of different food options. Raohe is kind of known as the foodies night market. Shirlin is the biggest one in Taipei. It has a little bit more of a variety with more clothing, more shops, more souvenir kind of places like that. But they both kind of have their own unique specialties. Raohe has a lot of Michelin starred um, food stalls there. One of my favorite ones when I went there that's really, really famous is black pepper pork buns, which are delicious. Um, 
The one that I would go to the most frequently though was the Shida Yeshu, the Shida Night Market, which is the night market right next to where the um, university is. This night market is kind of unique because it caters a little bit to a younger crowd because it's right next to the university. A lot of the people who go there are obviously college students. And so there's a lot more trendy clothing stores, a lot of kind of games and shops that cater to dates and kind of the college age crowd. It's really fun because a lot of the food there is a little bit cheaper because it is right next to the college. So there's lots of good budget options and lots of really good food. The Feng Shao one in Taichung is thought to be the biggest one in all of Taiwan. It's really cool. There's a lot of different things there. And then the Liu He one in Kaohsiung is really cool because Kaohsiung, being right next to the water, kind of the sun and the um, Taiwan, it has a lot of different seafood stuff. So a little bit of the different food options from some of the other night markets because a lot of it's more focused on seafood than the other ones. Um, as obvious, right, one of the biggest draws of these night markets is the food. Um, Taiwan night markets are known for having a huge variety of different dishes. A lot of the times it can be a little bit overwhelming because you go in and there's just, it feels like forever um, of different shops selling all sorts of different things. Um, I think one of the coolest things though is that you get a chance to try a lot of the different things. Some of the famous things at the Taiwan night markets are the chou tofu, the stinky tofu, super popular. Um, Taiwanese fried chicken is really popular. Uh, the um, bubble milk tea is originally originally in Taiwan, so that's popular here as well. You can also get a version without tea where you just get the bobas and milk, or you can get them in various different fruit drinks, which is awesome. These are a couple of the more traditional things that you're going to see at a lot of the Taiwan night markets that I would frequently get. On the left here, we have some guo tie, some um, dumplings. On the right, we have zhua bing, some scallion pancakes that you can get eggs and different things added to. I eat these a lot here because a lot of the times they're relatively cheap really yummy and you can get them all over the place. Um, these are a couple of kind of the more fun things that um, I saw in my time in the night markets. The one here on the left is they have all these stalls where they cook meat. Um, this particular one here, they were cooking steak, but they use a blowtorch to cook it right in front of you. Then this one on the right here is a famous Michelin starred stall in the Brown night market where they sell this bone broth. That was kind of unique. It was a little bit hard to eat because it was mostly bones, but the broth was really delicious and supposed to have some healing properties. In addition to lots of good food, they also have a ton of really, really good desserts. The one um, picture on the left here is from Ximan Ding at a spot called Xing Fu Tong, which has some really, really good brown sugar bubble milk. And then the one on the right here is at the Shida Ye Shi, where me and my friends would frequently go. This is a little churro place that we found where they make these churro cones and put ice cream inside of it. That was delicious. So. Lots of really good desserts, lots of really good food, a lot of really yummy, snacky stuff. Two of my favorite things, though, I think, from my time here in the night markets is one on the left here is mu guan niu nai, papaya milk, which is really delicious. It's a really light flavor, where they just blend together fresh papaya and milk. And then this picture on the right here, which is tang guru, where they get lots of different fruits, or a lot of times it's tomatoes as well, and they put this sugary coating around it, and you eat it off these kebabs. Both really great desserts. In addition to a lot of the food, like I mentioned earlier, shopping is a big thing in a lot of the night markets. There's lots of different stores. There's some stores that cater towards a lot of different trendy clothes. There's a lot of stores that cater to a lot of different souvenirs, lots of handmade things, lots of just ruyong champin, lots of calendars, lots of sticky notes, lots of pens, stuff like that. So a lot of people will come to the night market just to pick up a couple things for shopping wise. In addition to shopping and food, the other big draw of the night markets is some fun entertainment. Claw machines as well as a lot of carnival games are really popular. A lot of them, you'll see games like the balloon darts. You'll see games like throwing the ring onto the bottles. And then all over the place, you'll see claw machines. In every night market, at least a couple stalls, just have 20, 30 feet deep filled with 30, 40 claw machines, which is really fun. Um, where a lot of times when people want to have a break from eating food, they'll come down and use the claw machines. Last one, at least to kind of wrap it up, just some personal tips from my experience about visiting night markets. The number one one would be to bring cash. These are all kind of small mom and pop stalls. And so a lot of them don't have the ability to take cards. So cash is king. A lot of times smaller bills are better. A lot of times they'll have a hard time breaking bigger bills, but having coins and smaller bills is what you want when you're going to a night market. You also want to try a variety of different foods. Kind of the fun thing about night markets is that you can try lots of different things. A lot of the stalls sell kind of smaller 
um, package sizes of things. So you can go to lots of different stalls, try lots of different things, share with friends and just have a good time. The other thing that I realized pretty quickly is when you go into these night markets, a lot of times you're going to bring water with you. There's not anywhere you can normally get water in the night market. A lot of times there'll be 7-Eleven or a family mart on one end of them where you can pick up drinks, but um, none of the stalls really have drinks. You get pretty thirsty because a lot of the food is fried. And so bringing some sort of water or Gatorade or something with you in it is really helpful. The other thing that's a kind of a problem a lot of times is Taiwan is not known for its abundance of trash cans. It can be a lot of times pretty hard to find trash can. So when you're walking through, make sure you scope out where the trash cans are. Sometimes there'll be one in the middle. Sometimes there'll just be one on the ends. Um, you're going to kind of gather together a lot of random little different trash things that you're going to have to throw away. So knowing where you can put those um, is helpful. So you're not carrying around the entire time. The next tip would be that the places with the longest lines generally have the best food. Um, especially when there's a lot of locals in line. So even if it takes a little bit longer, all the stalls are really pretty efficient at helping get through a lot of people and are able to have some really awesome food. Last but not least, my last tip would be make friends with the stall owners. They're awesome. The spot here on the right, this Cirque Charles, um, we chatted with them and it was really cool. It was this college guy who ended up dropping out of college. He opened up his own churro stand and he was telling us about it. He was telling us what it was like, how he was working and stuff like that. He was really cool. He ended up giving us a lot of free um stuff because he just thought we were cool and he was glad that we took the time to kind of talk to him about it but that's my impression about Taiwan night markets and on to the next part okay so the next part of our presentation is about Shan, which is located in Kaohsiung so the Buddha Memorial Center or Shan is a major landmark in southern Taiwan in 1927 Master Xing Yun established the Shoshan Temple in Kaohsiung City. And then um, by 1967, the original temple was sold and then the funds were used to purchase, purchase 194 hectares in Dashu District. And then that began the new temple construction, um, which it included the Buddhist college, the main hall, the child care center, clinic, and um, the Buddha's tooth relic apparently is also there as well. And in 2011, the memorial was completed and it has eight pagodas. It has the world's largest bronze Buddhist statue. And it's really pretty. There's like scenic park and mountains in the back. So 35% of Taiwanese are Buddhists. And Foguangshan has impacted Taiwan in a handful of ways. For example, Buddhist revival it brings a co um, contemporary view on Buddhism. And it also serves a lot of um, educational initiatives. For example, it operates a lot of universities and um, schools and pr that promotes Buddhist values and provides high quality education. And it also um, helps with a lot of community service within Taiwan. So Foguangshan is known for its extensive charitable activities, including disaster relief, medical care, and support for the underprivileged. Um, they also do a lot of humanitarian work and um, such as operating hospitals, orphanages, disaster relief programs. For example, it has provided aid and support to communities affected by natural disasters, such as earthquakes and floods. And then lastly, it's affected the tourism in Taiwan as well, bringing more tourists to the country. Um, one thing that we were able to see in Fogongshan was sutra calligraphy. And so when we went there, they had a lot of um, just phrases already. A lot of them are from the Song of ten, the Ten Practices or Roots of Wisdom by Master Xing Yun. And they gave us little strips of paper to just copy the uh, writings and with like ink pens, basically. Um, it was really peaceful in there. It was very quiet, was great to just think. And yeah. And just a few fun facts about the Buddha statue. It's 354 feet tall. It's one of the tallest statues of Buddha in the world. It's the world's largest copper cast Buddha statue. And the hand sign that it's making um, is, I guess, the teaching hand gesture. And then when we were there by the Buddha, there were four, um, I guess, kind of pagoda type things with a 
Buddha inside each of them. And they're called the four principal bodhisattvas. I don't know how to pronounce it, but the first one you can see on this map over here, um, it is this Buddha encompasses compassion and mercy. And when we were there, the tour guide kind of described it as like the Christ for Buddhism in a way. Um, the second one is the Buddha of supreme wisdom, intelligence, and enlightenment. And this Buddha um, is often people go there searching for guidance and understanding. And when we were there, they had different offerings that we could go like place there. And then the next one is the Buddha of the earth and afterlife. And so um, it's known for um, its vows to help beings in the underworld, I guess, and guide souls into the afterlife. And then the last one was the Buddha of practice and vows. And so this Buddha um, represents commitment to Buddhism and the path of enlightenment. The site that I visited and chose to research about further for the topic of architecture in Taiwan is Taipei 101. It is one of the most famous buildings in Taiwan and something that we must see when we visit. Taipei 101 is a landmark skyscraper in Xinyi District. It was the tallest building in the world from 2004 to 2010. It stands at 508 meters tall and has 101 floors, which is why it's called Taipei 101. Uh, when I first saw Taipei 101, I was amazed by the building and its architecture. On the um, surrounding Taipei 101, there are shopping malls, dining restaurants, um, outdoor and indoor observatories. You can also pay to go all the way to the top of the building where you can have an amazing view of the whole city. I have been to Taipei 101 several times um, since I've been here for the last two months and every time it is busy, um, filled with people. It is definitely one of Taiwan's most famous landmarks. As I did some additional research, I also learned more about how amazing the modern engineering of the building is. Taiwan can be considered a tropical island. Um, typhoons happen frequently on average 13 times a year. When engineering Taipei 101, the engineers needed to make sure that this building will be stiff enough to resist the ty frequent typhoons. Um, in addition, Taiwan is also located near a seismic belt and is constantly threatened by earthquake hazards. So not only does this building need to be stiff, it also needs to be flexible enough to resist earthquakes. This means that the, the building needs to have a strong foundation, but it also needs to be flexible to resist um, any movement in the building. Because of Taiwan's condition, it was not an easy task to create the skyscraper. I learned about the modern technology that was used to create this building. For example, there is an innovative damper system to help the building stabilize from earthquakes and winds. The pendulum inside swings back and forth in response to the tall building's movements. This device are detected by sensors and can reduce building movement by 30 to 40%. And this helps stabilize the building. However, Taipei 101 is not only famous for its impressive modern technology. I also love how it incorporates Asian styles and aesthetics to make it even more unique. The building resembles a Chinese tradition resembles many Chinese traditional aspects and also has great feng sui. Feng in Chinese means wind and sui means water. And feng sui is the practice of arranging pieces in living spaces to create balance with the natural world. Chinese people believe that rearranging certain furniture or locating your home and building in a certain way or specific location can help bring luck and fortune 
These concepts were embedded in the building of Taipei 101. When you first look at the building, it is very similar to a traditional Chinese pagoda. And there are eight segments um, that build up Taipei 101. Eight in Chinese um, is ba, and that is very close to the word fa, which means luck and bringing wealth. Lots of the feng shui that surrounds um, Taipei 101 has to do with luck and money. And some examples of that is the gu qian and ru yi. Um, first, gu qian means um, just like ancient Chinese coins. And you can see symbols of gu qian all over Taipei 101, including um, by the entrance. The 101 is depicted with the gu qian. And you can see that on the bottom right of the slide. And the Wu Li is a former tool of imperial officers, scholars, and staff. And both of these kind of represent wealth and gaining money as well. And also the money biting turtle um, that is on the side of Taipei 101. You can't see it very clearly from the bottom, but uh, in this picture, you can see it right next to Taipei 101 on the left. And in Chinese, this is Yao Qian Gui. And it also goes along the same topic of attracting luck and fortune for the people here in Taiwan. Um, I think it is so interesting to see the combination of modern and traditional aspects in one building. I love that Taipei 101 is located right in the middle of the city, filled with modern technology and big buildings. But it also stands out because of its kept traditions. I think if you visit Taiwan, definitely check out Taipei 101. Learning about its feng shui and its engineering has helped me appreciate the building even more and its uniqueness.